thank you so much. Um, thanks a lot uh, for organizing this and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to present some early results from this project where I'm gonna be talking about uh, whether competition between public officials in a market can reduce uh, corruption. This is gonna be using evidence from a cash transfer program in Pakistan. This is joint work with um, Mohammed Hedisleeb at the University of Bristol and Kate Viborni at Duke University. Um, so yeah, just FYI, I'm not able to see a lot of people or chat or comments. So just feel free to stop me at any point if I'm running over. Um, sure, uh, so I think I probably don't need to uh, motivate a lot with this audience why corruption matters, but just very quick backdrop is that corruption is rampant in many developing countries and beyond just the fact that it acts as a tax on service delivery and makes service delivery more costly, um, the efficiency and equity costs of corruption far exceed the amount that was originally stolen. There's a wealth of literature uh, using empirical evidence to show that the downstream welfare effects of corruption are large and they're persistent. So, for example, if public officials steal from like some road construction projects or schooling, those types of effects, um, you know, far exceed the amount that was originally appropriated um, and persist for a while. So corruption is quite important in that context. Um, and separately, there's a literature in macro development that um, has shown that uh, corruption substantially explains some of the low growth rates that we observe in developing countries. So given that context, um, the existing literature that tries to tackle corruption mostly focuses on uh, detecting corruption and punishing corrupt public officials. So this can take the form of um, audits or of uh, community or state-led monitoring of these public officials. But um, the success of these types of interventions obviously relies uh, crucially on their implementation, which in and of itself can be a challenge. It's kind of like this cash way to where to tackle corruption, you need to have, uh, you know, non-corrupt officials who are willing to implement these programs. And that doesn't always happen when corruption is systemic um, or there's weak state capacity. So given that, um, it seems quite appealing that if we could have some kind of a market-based mechanism that self-enforces itself um, in these contexts where state capacity is otherwise weak, um, by disincentivizing public officials from committing corruption in the first place, that would be quite useful for developing countries. Um, so you, the, in this talk, I'm going to present this framework where I suggest that we think of public officials as a firm, uh, where they provide a particular service. This would be a public good. You can think of it um, as passports, as driver's licenses, um, those types of things. Um, they provide these services and can charge a price for it. The reason they can charge a price for it is because they have the ability to limit the supply of these services. So for example, they can substantially delay your access to it or inhibit access altogether to these application systems. Um, and in return for actually providing this service, um, given the power that they have over the supply of these services, they can charge a price, which is uh, the bribe. Um, so standard economic theory would tell us that uh, if you increase competition between public officials, this competition at the public official level could uh, reduce corruption because um, if I'm asked for bribes by one public official and I have the ability to search for rival officials who don't ask for as much of a bribe, that would be good for me as a customer. And um, as competition increases, um, any agents that are charging prices that are above the marginal cost of providing that service should be competed out by price competition, but unless of course there's collusion. But collusion itself becomes quite hard uh, to sustain because um, once competition increases, wait, sorry, the um, I need to go and turn on the lights in the room, which have just decided to go off for no reason. Give me one second. Sure, sure, take your time. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I was saying the collusion itself can be uh, very difficult to coordinate once there are a, a large number of public officials. So once competition increases uh, sufficiently, uh, you can expect that the equilibrium bribe price would be zero. So in theory, um, competition um, between public officials can reduce corruption. However, this theory has been difficult to test um, empirically. 
because you need a lot of conditions um, for being able to test it. Um, first of all, you need to be able to measure bribes, but because bribes are secretive by their very nature, it's difficult to capture them um, when doing field work. Um, then you need exogenous changes to the industrial organization of public officials, and um, usually governments don't let you experiment with market structure. Um, you also would need that these uh, competing public officials are providing the same type of products, exactly the same, for example, password or driver license, but also are producing it on their own as opposed to in collaboration with other departments, because then only can you study them as this standalone firm. So given these challenges, um, there is limited evidence that looks at whether competition can be used to drive down corruption in developing countries. The most uh, relevant paper that we're aware of is um, an Oaken and Barron paper that uh, looks at um, the uh, deployment of security officials along checkpoints um, across two major roads in Indonesia. And these uh, public officials uh, charge uh, bribes um, once trucks go through those checkpoints. And there was, um, after some uh, peace agreements, this uh, plausibly exogenous withdrawal of security forces, which they interpret as a shock to the market structure. And they use that to study whether these changes in market structure can reduce corruption. Now, this paper is more set up to understand a sequential holdup problem because you're driving down a road and like agents that are further down the road know that you're path dependent on this road and hence have more market power, as opposed to like you being able to search across different locations and having lots of outside options. So it's not the typical uh, type of marketplace that you would imagine. Um, and then, in addition, because of, again, the challenges uh, of studying corruption empirically, um, it makes sense that, that most of the work that looks at competition and corruption has been in lab, uh, in field settings. Um, this work is um, both new and has, at the moment, led to some inconsistent results. So there are some studies that show that an increase in corruption reduces, uh, sorry, an increase in competition reduces corruption, and there's others that show that competition doesn't necessarily help. So um, we think that we're making an important contribution in this space where evidence is actually quite limited on whether increasing market competition between service delivery agents can reduce uh, corruption. So what we're able to do this because we exploit um, a dramatic and an exogenous shift in the market structure of payment agents that deliver um, cash transfers in Pakistan. So you should think of these payment agents as mobile shops. So the shift was that Pakistan rolled out biometrics. And so uh, prior to biometrics, you could, um, as a recipient of the cash transfer program, uh, go to either this type of a human payment agent who can ask for bribes, or you can go to an ATM, which typically does not ask for bribes, given that it's not manned by a person. Um, after the rollout of biometrics, however, um, so biometrics mean that you have to go and you have to scan your fingerprint and verify your identity. So once the government rolled out this system where um, you have to like prove that your thumbprint matches what they have in the system, you can no longer do that at ATMs because ATMs are not typically enabled with uh, biometric readers. You have to now go only to a human payment agent. So you cannot, uh, there's this exclusive reliance on these public officials that are contracted by the state to deliver the money. Whereas initially you could just go to a machine and it would give you your cash. So we exploit this change where what we interpret it to be is that the human agents now know that they're the exclusive source through which you can withdraw money. And this is an exogenous shift in their market power. They know that they're more powerful. They don't have to compete with the zero bribe outside option. And that may mean that they charge more bribes, but their ability to charge bribes might depend on how many other human agents they compete with. Um, and so that's, I'm, I'm gonna talk more about the setting and explain a little bit more about what exactly this shift meant, but um, broadly, that's the type of context that we exploit to study this question. Um, so a quick preview of the findings is that, indeed we find there is um, more than 100% increase in side payments, once biometrics are rolled out, because human payment agents have experienced an increase in their market power, and they exploit that to extort bribes. However, um, the, both the incidence of and the amount that is demanded in bribes is lower in more competitive markets. So in markets where 
one payment agent has many other payment agents to compete with, the incidence of corruption is lower. Um, our contribution is to study um, the impact of market competition on corruption in a non-stylized large-scale reform that affects millions of households. Um, we follow these households over four survey waves and we have a panel, so we're able to like look at this in quite a rich way. Um, we're also able to you know, give quite um, nuanced uh, understanding of what type of competition you really need to be able to eliminate corruption. So what I mean by that is, um, what I'm gonna be showing you is um, whether a change in uh, the market structure of bribe seeking agents, so whether increases in competition between payment agents can uh, reduce uh, corruption benchmarked against a context where payment agents uh, also have a zero bribe outside option. So we are able to tell you whether basically competition alone, even without the need for automation, without the need for machines that cannot possibly ask for bribes, even amongst bribe seeking agents, just competition can reduce corruption because it's not always feasible to automate these processes. So even if you are stuck with uh, bribe seeking agents, introducing competition can solve um, some of the problems. And finally, uh, all of the work um, in this space um, has one important limitation, which is that um, the two actors that are involved in either paying bribes or uh, seeking bribes, um, I, at least one of the two, including in the field study that I just mentioned, um, the Oakland Environment Study, are aware of the fact that they are being studied in that moment. So there are some Hawthorne effects that result from it. What we're able to do is um, measure uh, bribes ex post after this two-sided negotiation has taken place. So we're not influencing in any way the demand for or uh, the payment of bribes. Um, so let me talk a bit about the, the context. So this is, um, the context is uh, the Benazir Income Support Program, which is a large cash transfer program that has been making unconditional payments since 2010. Um, it also makes conditional cash transfer payments. Our sample consists of the unconditional cash transfer recipients, which are proportionally more in number. Um, it's targeted to over 5 million low-income households. They're identified through a proxy means test. Um, it includes, uh, this basically for women. So this is an ever married woman who is supposed to go and receive the money. Um, these are quarterly payments of about, from, from the period that we are studying, they were about 5,000 Pakistani rupees, which at the time was 50 US dollars, that's no longer the case, but um, they've been increasing the amount uh, since then in, in uh, response to inflation. However, for this study, um, the beneficiary list, the amount, other program features, they stay constant. So the only thing that we're looking at is this exogenous shift in uh, the market structure of uh, the public officials that deliver this program. So just to give you a quick sense of the type of shift we're talking about. So previously you had this ATM card, you take it to a machine, you insert it, you put in your pin, it spits out money, you go home. Um, now we have uh, these biometric readers where you go to someone like a mobile money shop owner, they are equipped with these machines and you scan your fingerprint and then they say, yes, your thumbprint matches, here's your money or no, it doesn't and I cannot give you money. Um, so I, baseline, um, which is like before the rollout of biometrics anywhere in the country, um, all of the villages have um, access, almost all of them, like 99, 97% of them have access to ATMs. In addition, they'll have varying degrees of access to also these payment agents. So you could choose, you could choose to go to the payment agent or you could go to the ATM. Now we consider ATMs uh, to be the zero bribe option in that ATMs typically do not ask for bribes. In very rare cases, you can have a security person outside the ATM who refuses to let you in unless you go, but that's not in, in, the, in the data that we have before the rollout of this reform. We see that happen very rarely. Um, on the other hand, human payment agents can ask for bribes. So when ATMs are shut down in treatment areas, there's exclusive reliance on these payment agents, which means that they realize they have more market power. And, and even if like people are not using ATMs directly and we're always using payment agents, just the fact that payment agents know that there's this threat of people going to the zero bribe outside option is sufficient. Just the mere presence of ATMs we think is sufficient 
for human agents to know that you know they cannot ask for a lot of bribes but once that zero bribe option shuts down now they know you have no one else to go to um there's nobody like even if you go somewhere else they'll probably ask for bribes so this leads to um an increase in their market power but that increase in market power could itself be mediated by whether or not these payment agents exist in very competitive markets so they compete with other payment agents or if you were like the one guy in the village before this reform happened along with an ATM. Now the ATM shuts down and you have monopoly power, you can really uh, make a killing. So that's the type of comparison that we'd be doing. Um, we're gonna be using uh, for our household um, level outcomes um, on experience of service delivery, data that was collected by the Oxford Policy Management as part of their impact evaluations of the Venezuelan Income Support Program. This is a balanced panel of about 3,000 beneficiaries. We don't observe any differential attrition in 63 districts across Pakistan, um, covering four waves of surveys between 2013 and 2019. In addition, we have administrative data on all of the locations that you could uh, withdraw your cash from. This includes ATMs as well as payment points. So we use that to construct choice sets um, of market areas. And then finally, um, we're also going to be using uh, BISP administrative data. So we realize that our service sample is limited. So markets that we construct using payment point data may not be very representative of what people think of as markets. So um, what we do is we take an additional 100,000 randomly selected people from the BISP uh, administrative data for whom we observe their transactions as well as where they go to make those transactions. Um, and are therefore able to use this, um, you know, wider data, but also like less rich data to just validate um, our approach so far. And then um, we take sort of the string addresses of all the payment points and villages and geocode them across the country. And then um, we use open source routing machine, um, which you should, you can think of it as Google Maps basically to, co to compute travel distances between villages and payment points. The reason we use travel distance is just because we think it helps reduce some noise because um, five kilometers in Lahore may mean very different, uh, something very different from five kilometers in the Haley area. So um, what this, uh, what OSRM does is it just tells you what's the optimal way of getting from point A to point B, which can involve a mix of, you know, walking, getting on a bus, driving, whatever, like it's, is when we search on Google Maps for how to get somewhere and it gives us some optimal combination of different modes of getting there, that's kind of what we're using. But in general, even if you use linear distances, it doesn't really make a difference. And the reason we use OSRM over Google Maps, I think it's just because um, it was expensive to use Google Maps beyond a certain point, but we compare results very similar. The coverage is very similar regardless of what source you use. Um, Okay, so now we're able to exploit the rollout of biometrics to study this experimentally because um, the rollout was done in a staggered way. So um, before 2016, we have three rounds of data where none of the districts had been introduced to biometrics. Then slowly districts start to be transitioned to biometrics and uh, the process depends on how ready the local administration and the banks are with the contracts, the boss machine, the payment agents, like all of that procurement stuff, um, as and when it's done, um, districts shift to biometrics. And there's no, there's balance um, basically a baseline in this switch to biometrics for all of the outcomes of interest in this study. Um, there is, of course, um, some degree of sub-district variation in whether uh, you know, there might be some village that like still has an ADM that takes a bit longer to shut down, but we uses an intent to treat measure, these, this administrative decision to switch a district to biometrics, and it's quite a strong ITT. And in addition, um, any teething issues that we observe, like initially close to the switch, they go away within the span of the, uh, the study that we have. So we um, have, uh, you know, we have these districts transition, then we collect data in March 2019, which is our end line survey at which point um, various districts have been switched, but some haven't been. And so we're exploiting variation between uh, early and late treated units versus um, as of 2019, never treated units. Um, and using that, we're able to estimate quite a standard uh, difference in differences model. Um, first, just to look at 
what happens when you shut down ATM. So we're not, we're abstracting from the, from the competition question at the moment. So kind of as a first step, as a first stage, like does the shutdown of ATMs lead to any changes in, uh, for example, bribes? We look at that um, using difference and differences in event study where um, post times BVS means that BVS is the treatment indicator of biometric verification system being active. And um, post is just the, the 2019 period in which it is active in our, in our data. We're gonna be including household fix effects as well as controlling for our province um, year time trends. The identifying assumption is that early and late adopters and, and, and also never adopters have no differential pre-trends, their trends evolve similarly. I'll be showing you some event studies to establish that. Um, we pre-registered the specifications that you're seeing here before we had access to the inline group of data. Now we're gonna take the, uh, the specifications that you're seeing here, especially the difference in differences specification and interact that with competition. And um, what that'll give us is, uh, so particularly gamma will tell us what is the impact um, of uh, the switch to biometrics on, for example, bribes in places that are more competitive relative to places that are less competitive, finally benchmarked against places that are not switched at all to biometrics. Um, I'm gonna say more about what we mean by competition here, but it's essentially gonna be a village level measure. Uh, and again, uh, very similar identifying assumptions apply. Okay. Uh, so what, how do we define markets? That's um, a non-trivial question because, uh, you know, what do, what does a household consider its market to be is, uh, is, is difficult to infer, it varies um, based on the region because um, say that we say within five kilometers of a particular area, all of the payment, uh, payment points that, that fall in that radius are part of your choice set but five kilometers in again a place like Lahore may mean something very different relative to a more remote place with um you know nothing within five kilometers they may think of their market like 20 kilometers away so to incorporate um these challenges what we do is we look at um the village center um the centroid of the village we find the closest payment point to that center. So this could be an ATM, it could be a human payment agent. And then we add a buffer of 10 kilometers driving distance to the closest payment point. We draw a circle and everything that results in that circle is going to be part of your um, payment point. Uh, it's going to be part of your market. Um, so that's, uh, we construct village level markets um, in this way. Now, the next challenge is defining what it means um, to capture the level of competition in those markets. So we want to see whether these markets are becoming more competitive over time after the shutdown of uh, ATMs has an impact on competition. Uh, if we use time varying competition in our analysis, that could be problematic because um, payment agents at end line can enter or exit in response to for example, rent-seeking opportunities. So using end-line data could be potentially endogenous. So what, the way we get around that is um, we use at the moment a very coarse measure of, uh, of end-line competition, which is that we simply see the baseline number of post agents um, and try to use that to predict the end-line market structure. So this is before the reform was implemented, so it couldn't be in like baseline uh, payment agent coverage. Uh, could not possibly be driven by the reform itself. Um, there's, uh, you know, base, if you look just the residualized baseline number of POS agents, um, it strongly and positively predicts end-line number of POS agents. So if you're a place which had a lot of human payment agents, which is what I mean by POS agents, um, you're also likely to at end-line have a lot of these um, payment agents. So exploiting that, um, Oh my God, the lights are going off again. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that this would happen. Give me one second to turn them on. All right. Uh, so now um, off to results. Uh, so what we're showing you here is an event study specification. Um, 
where this is the post-treatment period and the outcome of interest is uh, the log of uh, amount paid in bribes, which is zero for people that did not have to pay any bribes. Um, and uh, this black line over here shows you the diff and diff estimate, the blue coefficients of the event studies just kind of overlaid on each other, the gray, the gray is the confidence um, interval of the diff and diff estimate. So what you're seeing here is that after the rollout of biometrics, there's a, there's a large and um, almost 100% increase in the amount that is paid in bribes. Um, we don't think that this effect is driven by any other aspects of the program. So for example, you might worry that um, before the rollout of biometrics, um, you, as a woman who is a beneficiary of the program, could give her ATM card to someone else to go and collect the money on her behalf. And then after the rollout of biometrics, she's obviously there in person to like scan her fingerprint. So maybe this is driven by a reporting effect. For example, she didn't know because she wasn't there personally and like someone from her neighborhood went to collect the money on her behalf, how much was paid in bribes and now she just knows better and maybe that's all we're capturing. Um, we, we test for that and we see that that's not the case because if you run the same regression for the women who collected cash both before the reform and after the reform, even for those women, there's a large and significant increase in uh, the, uh, the demand for bribes. Um, this is also not like, an off equilibrium type of an effect, which just results from initial teething issues because we test whether the effect is differential for um, places that adopted uh, biometrics early and hence were, were uh, exposed to the treatment for a longer period of time relative to places that adopted it late. Because if anything, in fact, um, places that have had it for a while, uh, the effect is stronger and uh, yeah, more persistent. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to flag that you have only five more minutes. Perfect, okay. So I have just two more slides. So I guess uh, what we what we see is that there is this increase in uh, the demand for bribes, which validates the, the framework that we're thinking of. ATMs have shut down, you realize you have way more market power, even if you existed already um, and you exploit that. Now, what I'm gonna show you is that, however, this effect is mediated by competition. So the first row is just what we were seeing previously, um, the extensive margin likelihood that you pay any bribes, um, is uh, positive and significant for places where biometrics were rolled out. And you also have, like, as, as well as the intensive margin. But in areas that had um, very, in areas that had more payment agents at baseline, which is predictive of also having more payment agents at end line, the amount that was paid in bribes, as well as the likelihood of paying any bribes is negative. So competition, even though they, there's shutdown of ATMs, payment agents exploit that, to charge more bribes, competition can counter those effects. So these effects are not um, less strong in places where there were more payment agents. Um, this, of course, is a slightly, so this is a work in progress, and these, this is the first time they were presenting these results. Um, so uh, it's obviously a little bit of a black box what it is about these places that at baseline had more payment agents. What makes them have more payment agents? We should sort of unpack that. And then also, um, there might be changes in market structure at end line that are not predicted by market structure at baseline. For example, the government may want to increase payment agent coverage precisely in the areas that had fewer payment agent coverages. So we want to ex we want to sort of account for entry and exit in a, in an exogenous way. So the work in progress that we're doing at the moment is uh, trying to unpack um, which baseline characteristics predict endline market structure the best and in an exogenous way and exploit that variation to redo um, some of the analysis I'm showing you today. So we're thinking of things like population density, um, banking penetration, uh, market access based on other topographical features like ruggedness in a sort of trade kind of a way, cell tower coverage and night lights. That type of stuff that we can throw into a lasso and, and see what actually predicts market power and then use that as an ID as opposed to the slightly more um, mysterious one that I showed you. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and uh, yeah, let you take away, Sonia. All right, thank you. Can I request you to stop sharing your screen? Perfect. Thank you so much for a very fascinating presentation. I would now request Dr. Farah um, for her comments, and then you can respond to her comments, and then we'll move to Lucas's comments. Yep. Over to you, Farah. 
Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so thanks, Eamon. Really interesting work and really well presented. So I, I genuinely enjoyed um, the material that I was provided. So some of these comments you may already be doing in your paper, and so I think some of these comments we just mentioned also in your next steps. Um, but to quickly summarize what this paper is about, it's um, testing if competition between service delivery agents reduces bribe through um, competition. Um, what I like about this paper is that you can isolate the impact of competition, which as Eamon kind of laid out earlier, is rare in literature uh, because there's an exogenous shift in the supply of service providers. Um, they have exposed data and they also have a lot of rich data set, which kind of helps with generalizability. And I feel like actually the last one is a bit too kind of undersell in, the, in your presentation. I think you can uh, bring this up a bit more. Um, so let me just, focus on some of the larger content, questions that I have uh, and suggestions actually, and then I can maybe share the screens for the minor ones. Um, so I was kind of curious about the context in which this is working. So obviously we know um, being in Pakistan, we know the context, but still how is it generally working before the program came in and how is it working afterwards? Um, so my uh, motivation for this is, I, I wonder if you can generalize your theoretical concept a bit more so you can, um, it's not based on very strict assumptions. I felt that the outside option being zero cost is kind of a strict assumption. I think you can relax that a bit. And I think you show that in your graphs as well. The outside option is not exactly zero. Um, and that's okay, right? That's more realistic to not have an outside option that's zero, but it's lower cost than the option that they have with human agents. Um, so, to me, this, with the switch, the outside option is actually switching from a low cost ATM option, not zero cost, cost to potentially higher cost, which where for women, this has kind of unobserved cost as well, because there's reduced anonymity with, with people that you're interacting with in, your, in the neighborhood, uh, mobile agents who now know you're getting this cash regularly, et cetera. Um, and so, um, yeah, so some of that I think could be kind of relaxed a bit. Um, and then I'm also curious about at baseline, if you can kind of describe the kind of respondents who selected the ATMs of human agents, I, you may not have a lot of data on this in the sense, there may not be many who, did, who made that switch, but it would be interesting to see still, um, because as, you know, this would kind of highlight what were some of the decisions or what were some of the motivations initially um, when there was an option to go to the ATM, uh, to go to the human agent and vice versa. Um, I think there are unobserved dynamics at play, which, which you know, this analysis at the moment might not be capturing. Um, and then along the same lines are the districts that adopt uh, the new model early, similar to the ones that do that late. I noticed that in your last slide, you said you're gonna be looking at this anyways, but you know, that should be um, a good thing to check also because it's gonna impact the, the validity of the instrument that you've used as well. Um, on the identification strategy, there's a lot of literature, as I'm sure you're aware, which is looking at staggered DID. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've run the Bacon et al. diagnostic, and you know, I don't think this, that you would find different results, but it might be still nice to just show that it's robust to using alternate estimators. So just wanted to um, put that out there. Um, on robustness, uh, the decision to use the 10 kilometer boundaries seemed a bit arbitrary. Um, so it's, for women in particular, 10 kilometers seems a bit high. So again, in your paper, you may be doing this already, but I'd be very curious to see if, if the results hold, if, the, if it goes to five kilometers, three kilometers, you know, walking distance, et cetera. Um, because if it does, then it's a really strong effect. And then I have some other minor points, which were, so I was, so you didn't, uh, go over this in your presentation, but you know there, there's a figure that you've kind of shown in the appendix slides where the shift, where you show the shift to human retail agents, um, and it's less than 100%. So it says, I'm sorry, it says 100%, but it's less than. Um, what were the reasons behind that? Should it not be 100% by the end of the, you know, by now at least? Um, and once again, something that you mentioned before, how are the results on competition, not generally on price, but the competition results, how are they driven by new adopters and late adopters as well? Um, as if you, if you look at the providers, then the districts where the providers already existed and where the governments had to then set up some kind of an infrastructure. Um, 
then just curious how you would place this in literature on what the effect sizes are in relative to other studies. For instance, I'm thinking in particular about the NREGA paper. Um, so they found very high, uh, proportion-wise, very high bribes. I think you find something similar, but just curious if, if that's the case. Um, and so you mentioned one uh, source of underreporting, and you test for it, but there may be under, other sources of underreporting. So I, I'd be a bit more cautious in the sense, if these are mobile agents, a lot of times these are small grocery stores that are offering other services as well. So it may be, you know, there may be something else also going on. There's bribery in terms of the cash they receive from BISP, but maybe it gets compensated with discounts they get on other services like groceries and things like that. So um, that misreporting, I think, unless you have very detailed data, you may not be able to rule out um, but it may be biasing the results a bit. But I'll stop here and I can share the slides later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Farah. Uh, Eamon, would you, um, would you like to respond to Farah's comments or should we move on to Lucas and then you want to respond to the comments together? Um, yeah, I, I can take two minutes maybe to respond. I think, thank you so much, Farah. These were sure. uh, really helpful and useful comments. Uh, if you could go perhaps to your first slide with the main uh, comments. Uh, right. So I, yeah, I think I we completely take your point. We should do more work on understanding who it is that uses these um, payment agents at base. I think the, uh, the, the main thing that we're exploiting, however, is that like, even if you don't use ATMs and you use mostly payment agents, um, just a threat of having an ATM in the area, um, which charges, and I can, again, take your point that these are not exactly zero cost, um, especially there, there are instances for sure where security guards will try to prevent your access to ATMs. They're just like, in terms of orders of magnitude, so much smaller. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that we should do more careful work um, of documenting who it is that uses it. But I think in general, the framework is very much like, just the presence of these uh, ATMs seems to be reducing uh, bribes, and um, uh, I think yeah, I'll just I'll just stop here and like in response to your main comments um, because I realize that we have limited time. But it would be great if you can share your slides. Thank you. Thank you, Amen. Can I request uh, Dr. Lucas to please present his comments? Sure. Um, could I also share slides? Uh, Farah, can you stop mine? sharing? This? Yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah, you should see it right now. Um, first of all, I didn't put it on the slides, but I have to say I really enjoyed the, reading the paper, well, the slide deck as well. I really kind of, I bought your motivation and kind of the whole narrative of what we're learning from the paper. I found that quite convincing already at this stage. Um, it's kind of, and it's very, like the story that you line out is very intuitive and kind of, I immediately understand which story you want to tell, and the empirical strategy seems to be quite well suited. So that I was really, I really liked that part. I li like the paper overall, but I, I have a few questions. Like these are the four main questions that I can kind of up with by reading it. First is kind of given that your main result is a heterogeneous, heterogeneous treatment effect, if you want. That's kind of the main result. Then I ask myself kind of what is correlated with this number of agents, like with the competition measure. Because obviously like the competition measure makes a lot of sense in your narrative, but can it, I would like to understand kind of what are the determinants of baseline competition, basically. There's, I would guess more competition in more, ur uh, in more urban areas, potentially where individuals are also more educated. So there might be other factors kind of be behind this, which is obviously, I get some, it's difficult to test in this kind of study, but I think it would, it would kind of comfort me if you could show interactions with um, other things that are correlated with the competition term and then kind of show, okay, the competition term remains significant and things like average education levels that also on, they don't matter. Um, something like that would be good. And in particular, like one, like, this is in general a comment about kind of the correlates of the heterogeneity of the competition variable. But I was particularly interested in kind of what is actually the demand per payment point? Like how many payments are there? Because 
I haven't like I thought about this and I haven't really come to a, a clear prediction of what I think how the level of demand would influence this. Maybe it doesn't at all, but I think it would be very useful to think through kind of how does demand potentially influence this? Like, would we expect the same level of bribes if there's a lot of demand per agent, or would we kind of think of that that would the bribes would go down? I'm not quite sure what the dynamics are, but I think a discussion on that would be very helpful to just to kind of see uh, whether we would expect, like if you end up kind of with a theory that uh, you would expect to change, it's then something that you might uh, be able to test as well, kind of to provide some further theory, uh, like theory testing here. I like, and uh, the second point is kind of about individual level heterogeneity. I, that was far mentioned something along these lines as well. I'm just really interested in kind of like the incidence of corruption. Who will, who actually ends up paying this? Is it the people who initially like went to the ATM? Like maybe the people who initially went to the ATM, they are very aware of the potential for corruption, and then they somehow negotiate the bribes down. It's like I think there's lots that you can do here, kind of to just show where the incidence lies and who ends up paying for the bribes. That obviously has distributional consequences, um, but it's also potentially can tell you something about the mechanism as well. And then what I stumbled over that's kind of uh, a slide in the appendix, more you only mentioned briefly in the slides, kind of, I found it very unintuitive that the treatment effects increase over time. Um, so like, to me, if this competition story is right, I would expect entry over time. And like that bribes are competed kind of down at least, if not out, um, uh, over time. But that's not what you find. So I, I think like this is a very interesting result. So and uh, um, I can kind of see two factors contributing this. One is kind of there might be barriers to entry for these points of sale agents. Uh, so it's kind of it's not costless to enter the market. That's certainly true. Just like for the um. Well, for the technology that you need, but I think a discussion of that would be useful just to kind of see kind of what um yeah what what prevents people from coming into the market and then second the second ex potential explanation came up uh, like I find plausible I think you mentioned some work something along this lines as well maybe they learn over time so like they are first in a low bribe equilibrium and then they realize oh we have less competition now there's not the threat of going to the ATM anymore maybe I can charge bribes and then they might uh, start out by like charging like very low bribes and then they get more and more emboldened over time as they realize oh people don't actually have a choice and I can actually do this this is um like a potential story one idea how you could test this potentially um is I thought this, like the learning process should be fast in areas where there are less ATMs to begin with or no ATMs to begin with in a way, because people like they were already previously in that position of not having a good outside option. So they might like be faster to um, converge to this um, new like equilibrium. Similarly, like to as maybe they, it's not learning, but actually they need to establish collusion over time. That doesn't happen immediately. So they kind of need to observe what the others do and they need the tacit collusion, or like from tacit collusion or active collusion. And one thing that I don't have on the slides, but I think what might be useful, in addition to looking at kind of the markets and the distance of points and points of uh, sale, like at the number of points of sale, you could look at how close to each other are the points of sale in a given market. So I would expect that in, if in the market, the points of sale are the opposite ends, really far away, they would struggle much more to establish collusion than if there's like the same, a same similar market with two points of sales that are very close to each other where they can observe each other's behavior. Obviously, it could also go that they then compete more, but assuming that they actively collude, it would be like they would be more likely um, to like uh, be able to communicate and so on and to like uh, monitor the coll uh, collusive behavior. And finally, because you mentioned um, things about uh, like trying to um, find like to predict entry into the new points of sales of new agents, I think like one measure that came to my mind um, 
there is actually excess demand. So how much demand for payment is there per kind of agent at baseline? So um, I think that should be a pretty good measure in terms like to predict entry. I mean, empirically, obviously, I don't know, but theoretically, I would expect kind of excess demand uh, in a way, uh, well, like it's always relative to other districts, but in places where there's more demand per points of sale, the incentives to enter should be higher because it's just the market, uh, the potential market up for grabs is larger. So it might be another thing that you could use but yeah, I don't know if instrument I'd have to think this through, but that's definitely a measure that I would expect to be quite correlated there. And then minor comments. Yes, I also think you should look at the new difference and difference literature. In most cases, it doesn't make a difference, but like every referee is going to ask you for that. So that's uh, definitely something. And then also about effect sizes. Um, that's also something I'm sure you would do like in the paper anyways, but just carefully looking um at the um yeah like at the welfare effects in a way um in terms of gripes paid and then um the one thing that is kind of along those lines currently you put in the measure lin linearly i think um so assuming that every new uh point of sales agent kind of has the same effect on uh like competition on competition basically but Effectively, I think most models would be take kind of a decreasing return to competition. So that kind of then like the second and third sales, extra sales agents have a lot, much larger impact in terms of um, competition rather than the nines or tens. So I don't quite know what the distribution of these eight numbers are, but looking at the nonlinear effects would I think be quite useful. Yeah, that's uh, my discussion. Thank you so much, Lucas. Those were very interesting points. Eamon, would you like to respond? And just very quickly, thank you so much. These are very, very useful. Um, as both you and Farah point out, we should look more at the individual level heterogeneity. I think right now we're just sort of netting it out with household fixed effects. We do have very rich data on their asset ownership. So not only like who like pay is more bribes, but this also they might also have different willingness to pay for bribes, for example, to skip the queue if they're slightly wealthy. I mean, these households are fairly, they're the ultra poor, so they're quite similar on a lot of these characteristics, but we definitely have data to look for, for example, education level, asset ownership, that type of stuff. Um, and uh, I think the collusion uh, channel, like testing whether there is, uh, whether we're seeing collusion happen in some of these markets is also super interesting. We've been trying other ways of capturing it, but I think your suggestion of looking at uh, the density of payment points within a particular region of the market um that sounds really uh good and we, we're going to try to do that i think it's very useful um and yeah at some point we will spend a few weeks of our life doing the new definitive literature um and hopefully it'll be fine i think one of the things that we feel a bit reassured by is that we're using look at this literature also trend, uh, uh, test for pretrends in a more in a more robust way than what i was showing you at the moment uh, so thank you so much. Uh, points very well taken, and this is incredibly useful. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so, Eamon, we have um, a question, like two questions in the question and answer box. One is by Fatma and other by Rishab. I'm going to first request Rishab if he wants to ask his question himself or, um, you know, otherwise you can, you know, just go over and respond. Um, so... Risha, would you like to ask your question? Um, I think even you can um, take the question. Okay, so um, I think, uh, let me just read out the question quickly. So um, Rishabh's saying that, um, he says, I have a question related to that, uh, as if you see cash transfers, the process innovation which needs fund transfer r d and financial flows as well how it can be how can it seamlessly work especially in developing countries irrespective of corruption and malpractices we've seen competition drive and biometrics and it is successful for restricting leakage for some for some so can there be a more robust solution in the long term so i think um let me just step back and say one thing which uh, i think i the my co-author share this view is that um the cash transfer itself is a fantastic initiative, and because it is uh, nationwide, uh, 
especially in contexts like Pakistan, you expect for there to be um, some amount of corruption and some amount of leakage. Um, I think the intention here is to see uh, these policies, for example, the rollout of biometrics, they had um, some well-intentioned objectives behind them. So one of them, which we explore in a separate paper, is that previously the woman would give the card to someone else and that someone else would go and withdraw the cash and maybe pocket it and the money wouldn't trickle down to the woman, for example, if it's her husband or some other member of the family. So the government motivation behind rolling out the biometrics was that personally going scanning your fingerprint and collecting to retain her cash. So these technologies and, you know, like you know, these, uh, the switch to biometrics in particular, it is an innovation. Um, it is one of the, I think Pakistan is one of the first, um, along with India to roll it out. And her ability to retain cash. But here we're documenting in particular that this technology can have um, unintended consequences. And I think it's a very nice silver lining that's simply increasing competition, which also we think has happened since the study. So the study um, happens shortly I guess he would be rejoining. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Just to keep conversation going, uh, one question since I have not read the paper. So how are they exactly? So Eamon is back. I think she's back. I would yeah. ask this question directly to Eamon. Yeah. yeah. So Eamon, uh, one question and one suggestion. So uh, my question is how exactly you are measuring corruption? So... Um, what you are um, calling bribes, so how it's self-reported or it's actual incidents of corruption. So how are you measuring it? It's self-reported, yeah. So it is um, uh, self-reported by the beneficiaries or by the beneficiary. Yeah. Okay, the question so is, I think the last time you collected a cash transfer, where you asked to unwillingly pay a bribe to withdraw it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, so, and, and then you're calling bribe like in cash, in actual <laughs> cash, because sometimes even if there is a delay, so people also call that, you know, okay, so there is corruption. So it's like very broad area. So do the beneficiary, they understand how you're defining bribes. So it's, yeah, it's really so cash. Uh -huh. It's really the, the amount that they paid. Yeah. So the question is quite clear about that. And you're absolutely right that there can be other types of corruption. So one of the corroborating uh, pieces of evidence that we see in the data is that uh, the beneficiaries also report lower satisfaction with the biometrics payment system. So that seems to show that they realize that something has changed and they're not very happy about this change. So and uh, the, yeah, the queues are longer as well. I mean, there's a whole host of problems for the thing that we're most concretely able to measure um, is uh, the bribe. Okay, so, uh, and one suggestion about the motivation of your work, I would say that in the beginning you said that, so we are looking at really uh, like competition in market, like if you just introduce the competition, then you can control the incidence of corruption. So I was just thinking that maybe uh, when we are talking about competition and then we are comparing machines versus humans, so so then, and we all know that when it comes to humans, so then we have sun cost, bonded rationality, so many other behavior limitations, right? So how are you taking care of those behavior limit limitations when you're comparing that with the machines? And we know like machines can work in parallel, mm -hmm. but when it comes to humans, so our brain works in sequence. Yeah. So I would just say that, you know, really uh, not calling it competition, but because it's a high, it's a low stake setting but when it comes to high stake setting in public offices so then um calling it like really uh, competing machines with human in high stake decision setting 
would not be a good idea. So I would really change the motivation a bit that, look, this is like very low stake setting. And um, so it's no complicated decisions or human or values or emotions are involved. So here uh, doing it with the machine would be a good idea. So just, you know, tweaking the motivation a bit would be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just one very quick response to that is I, we're also looking at relational contracts. So like the length of relationship you had with a particular payment agent, um, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, we're trying to, uh, to sort of look, think along these lines that you mentioned about like the more human aspects of this relationship as well. Um, yeah. And that's working progress. Thank you. Um, so Eamon, we have, I think, one clarification question from Fatma. Uh, by competition, you mean more payment agents? Uh, which I think the answer is yes. Okay. Um, and uh, so I I have one more question because we have two more minutes. So I'll I'll try to you know be quick and then we'll wrap it up. Is um because your your question really is that competition when there is greater competition, people have more options, more in terms of payment agents to go to, and that's why they're able to drive down the right price. But um, what I'm thinking is that because that somehow is based on the assumption that there's costless switching happening do you think are there any costs associated with switching payments agent because um if it depends on the distance to from their house or you know any other factors would that matter for causality how do you take that how do you think about that yeah so i think that's a really important constraint which i think our framework accounts for because um in theory if there are more competitive markets like you live in a rural area and you could travel uh to like karachi to go and withdraw your money um it, we should see lower bribes than what we're seeing um eventually but the issue is that these are uh, you know poor uh women with limited education and limited mobility and so the switching, like you can't, like even though there are more competitive markets that exist out there with lower bribe prices, you can't really switch um, that easily, especially after the reform when the woman has to go herself and collect money. Um, and hence you're stuck with the village uh, that you're in and the market that's around that village. And that's part of the motivation that we try to incorporate in constructing markets in this way. Previously, if you gave your car to your husband, he could like take it to the city and withdraw money when he goes there for work. Um, but yeah, it, it does get a lot more costly to adapt to the change in market structure. And, and that's one of the things that we exploit by talking about this place-based market. Well, thank you so much, Eamon. Um, it's already 6 p.m. Uh, but, you know, I enjoyed the talk very much and I, I hope, you know, the audience had a um, enjoyed it too. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone, Eamon, our discussants, all the panelists, all the attendees for taking out the time for this talk. Um, that brings us to the end of the fall edition of the virtual Krebs seminar series. And hopefully we'll have a new chapter of this series next semester, which you know hopefully would be the spring edition with um, another interesting lineup of um, speakers but for now um we'll sign off and you know hope to see you all soon thank you Eman. thank you thanks Lucas. everyone thank you Eman. Bye. thanks Anya.